Thank you, Gary, for being here today. Can you tell everyone your full name and how do you help clients? Uh, my full name is Gary Arndt. And uh, I kind of at least was in the travel industry. And I was traveling around the world for, well, 14 years, nine of which I basically didn't have a home. So I have a great deal of travel experience. And uh, a lot of the clients I work with in the field of travel rely on my expertise and experience in traveling. Excellent. Now, I know how you said you're in the travel business. How did the pandemic alter your, your, your course? Well, considering the entire industry basically disappeared, I would say that it rather radically changed it. Um, when all, I was in Portugal in February of last year, and at the time, if you remember on the news, there was still talk about, oh, this is happening in China, and you know, you know, that it was over there. It wasn't something that we were concerned about. And I got back from Portugal. I lived in Minneapolis on February 28th of 2020. The first week of March, I probably had COVID because I got really sick for about a week, but it was still at that time when we didn't have tests and stuff yet. And what few tests we had, they were mainly for, you know, uh, hospital workers and things like that. And while I felt crappy, I didn't, you know, I wasn't deathly ill and I, I got better and I never went and actually got checked because it was still, there were limited numbers. And now that I was better, I didn't feel it was necessary. And I thought that this was in all, you know, then the lockdown started and I felt, oh, this will be over in about a month, you know, uh, by April, this should be done. And maybe May we'll get back to doing it. Cause you know, we've never, we've had like SARS and stuff like that. And in fact, I have some uh, people I know in China and I was talking to them about, oh yeah, maybe we can come in May cause they're going to need help getting their tourist industry back. Obviously that never happened because you know, uh, it just got worse and worse. And then I, in the summer, I started thinking, well, in the fall, I could lead some tours maybe and some national parks in the U.S. It's not international travel. That never happened. And then the enormity of what was happening kind of dawned on me. And I personally lost about 95% of my income. Um, I do projects like photography projects with uh, tourist boards and other travel brands. All gone. 100% gone. Uh, I have traffic Right. that dropped dramatically because people weren't searching for travel anymore because they weren't going on trips. Uh, I have affiliate income of people booking trips that all disappeared. Uh, so it, 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 long story short, it was devastating. So sorry to hear that. Yeah, I definitely can understand. So switching subjects and we'll come back to that a little bit. What do you love most about clubhouse? You know, it's the, the interesting thing about Clubhouse is that a lot of the social platforms have become really toxic, that people behave online in a way that they would never behave in a, in a you know, a, if, if you were talking to a real person. There, there are decorum and certain social norms that we follow, yet people seem to have no problem destroying those norms online. I have yet to see any truly nasty behavior on Clubhouse because when you hear a person's voice and you're talking to a real person and they're not just a, an anonymous name online, you go back to those social norms that we're used to, that even if you may disagree with someone, you'll have a discussion about it and not just immediately, oh, you're horrible and do the stuff that you might do on like Twitter or YouTube comments or things like that. And it's the civility that, I actually kind of enjoy about Clubhouse, that it's the one platform where people behave like they would in real life. Definitely agree. Um, what cool connections have you made just by being on Clubhouse? Oh, quite a few. Um, I travel a lot. And one of the things that I enjoy about traveling is that you meet people that you would otherwise never get to meet. So you're at a hotel or a hostel and you're up at night and there's a common area and you start a conversation with people. And Clubhouse is a lot like that. And I've met people from all over the world who are also interested in travel and they can't travel. And I'm meeting them in a kind of a serendipitous way. 
And one of the other things that, that really I don't like about the whole online ecosystem is that we all get trapped in our bubbles and we're fed information that's algorithmically given to us. So if you show an interest in one thing, you just keep getting that one thing over and over and over. And that, that can be fine to a point. But the nice part about Clubhouse is that it's not filtered. And so you are going to meet people from different walks of life, from different parts of the world who maybe share different beliefs and you can talk to them or listen to them at least, you know, depending on the size of the room. And because there, so yeah, you can select what room you want to be in, uh, but it's not nearly as bad of a bubble type situation as what you're going to find on Facebook and other platforms. True. Now, going back to your um, business, have you generated any leads for your business just by being on Clubhouse? Not on Clubhouse per se, because my business is very consumer facing. And a lot of the people on Clubhouse tend to be like B2B um, marketing. They have consulting, they do coaching, they do things like that. I'm very consumer focused. So... Well, I, I guess that's not necessarily true. I know I've gotten quite a few people who, you know, they read my bio at least and they're like, oh, wow. Um, or yesterday I was in a room and I have a fairly large Twitter following. I got a, uh, a, a authorized or not a verified account and I've had it for a very long time. And I joined a room yesterday and someone just peeks and he goes, Gary, I got to know Barack Obama follows you. How did that happen? It's like, I didn't know Barack Obama followed me. He follows half a million people. I don't think it's really that big of a deal. But there are people that will like, you know, check you out, your bio and stuff, and they become followers. They, uh, I know a lot of people have started subscribing to my podcast, and that's kind of the biggest vehicle I use right now for selling tours, even though I can't really run any tours right now. So if there are other people who are photographers like you, what is one or two things you can give them to offer just for advice on how to pivot during this pandemic that we're in? Photography is becoming a very tough business because everyone has a phone uh, camera in their pocket right now. And a lot of the publications that normally paid for photography are no longer in existence or they're not paying much or anything anymore. So what a lot of people have ended up doing is shifting to things like running tours where you can actually take people out and instruct them in photography and let them, you know take them to a place where they can get good photos or they're doing some other form of instruction or, or something like that. That's kind of where a lot of the money has come right now. So even though if everyone has a camera in their pocket, doesn't mean everyone's a, a good photographer. And so you have more people wanting to improve their photography. That's one big area. And what I did is I actually uh, launched a new podcast last year. And that's been where I've been putting most of my work right now, not necessarily in photography. In fact, to, to be completely honest, I have not taken my camera out of my camera bag in over a year uh, since I got back from that trip from Portugal, because I just have had nothing to photograph. And even if I, I did, there's no business behind it anymore. And I've been putting all of my energy into my podcast, which is a daily show. It's a daily scripted show. I don't even have guests. So I have to write a script every single day for the show. Excellent. Very nice. Well, that's an excellent um, advice for people who can pivot and to do something different. Um, what piece of advice um, have you appreciated the most? Um, while being in clubhouse rooms? Um, I think you have to know when to speak up and know when to shut up. That there are times when, you know, I think you do have something to contribute, but there are also times where you probably should just sit back and listen. And if it's a travel room, I'll, I'll, I, I may say something, not necessarily eventually. I don't want to necessarily, you know, uh, jump in all the time and, and hog the discussion. Uh, but I think you should also use it. I, a lot of people, it's one of the things I don't like about clubhouse. I wish they got rid of the follower count because that's the one thing that makes it like a, a every other social platform and everyone's trying to get followers. And so you end up seeing things like, Oh, join this room and everyone follows everyone else. And if they had just hid the number and you just 
followed people on the basis of I am truly interested in this person and I want to hear from them in the future, uh, it'd be a radically different network. But yeah, I think the ability to know when to use it as a, a vehicle to, to say something and also as a vehicle to listen. And there are some people out there who are very afraid to speak up and they never talk. And then there are some people that always feel the need to talk and every room they're in, they have to say something, even though they really aren't contributing anything. Very true. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Gary. And where can people find you online? Uh, best place to find me online right now is Everything Everywhere Daily Podcast. And you can get it wherever you listen to podcasts. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gary. And we'll see you in Clubhouse. Thank you.